Welcome to Expo North and thank you for joining our third session on building a sustainable brand. Today we hear from three creative sustainable businesses gaining insights to the challenges they have faced and how they've built their business. The first is Scott Dixon, founder of Fox Water based in Glasgow. Fox Water offers the world's first water filter with refillable char cartridge. Their manufacturing and sourcing is based within the Glasgow area, keeping their carbon footprint down. We also hear from Izzy of Green Grove Foods, based in Forres, showing how, with a circular economy approach, we can use spent waste of coffee beans to grow food, in this case mushrooms. Finally, we talk to Jane Langley of Blue Patch, a sustainable business directory with a focus on exceptional products and services from the UK or Ireland. Blue Patch is a social enterprise that has been championing sustainable businesses for many years. So hi, Jean, lovely to have you here today. Um, we'd love to hear about you and Blue Patch. Hi, Joan, thanks so much for having me on air. Um, Blue Patch is a social enterprise, first thing to say. We are a directory for sustainable and ethical UK and Irish businesses. And we've been going since um, 2014, quite a long time now. Uh, we are um, a highly selective platform, so, rather than having you know terribly junior businesses we really focus on middle to high range businesses um, and we are very much a community for makers and for service providers as well great and and what was it that um made you set this up because obviously it's been running for a number of years now what what instigated it for you well um several things i used to be a uh, well, still am a painter and curator. And uh, when I was teaching fine art to students, which was you know, going on for 20 years plus, I realized that there were many, many talented artists who weren't in the kind of top, top blue chip galleries and that it was a real tragedy. And there was all this talent and resource that was, was not getting out to customers. Um, and so that was the, the first instance of my seeing that there was this kind of gap going on. Um, but I didn't want to deal with artists per se, I wanted to deal more with makers. So that's, that's why I set up Blue Patch, to kind of create a platform to connect makers to customers directly without any commissions going on. Um, but then the other thing that happened was I went to a lecture by Tom Friedman on climate change called Hot, Flat and Crowded. And that immediately projected me into looking at the whole environmental aspect and that's where the sustainability of the businesses joined forces with this this need to get makers uh, talented makers out to the public so yeah it was a perfect fusion brilliant and in terms of the sustainable ethos that's part of what blue patch is what are what are the criteria that you look for when you're selecting um, businesses to 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 be a part of the membership yeah well, it probably sounds old fashioned, Joan, but one of the things that we do is we have conversations with people. Um, I think it's amazing how much you learn just from speaking to a business owner. Things that really matter to us um, are really, someone's got to have integrity. I mean, this is crazy in this day, this digital age, isn't it? That when you're talking to a maker and they're really passionate about their customer, they're talking about the quality of materials they use. Um, they're talking about provenance of everything and their skills. You know that person really cares about what they're making. And that's the kind of business we want on Blue Patch. We're not interested in people who are, you know, don't care about the customer experience. Um, and also that aren't on that journey of sustainability. It's very easy for a business to come forward and, and greenwash with all the right kind of logos and everything but it's a completely different kettle of fish when a company comes forward and says well I've done this but I know this doesn't quite work what can we do about it and they they're, they're kind of accepting that they're on a real journey so I'd say the criteria for Blue Patch are high quality integrity and people who are accepting and humble enough to be on that journey toward being more sustainable in their business Excellent. And um, you obviously represent so many different makers um, from around the UK. Do you want to just give us a little overview of that, the sort of range of um, makers, producers that you have? Yes, I think 
I honestly think I have the best job in the world. I really do, because it's like a great adventure. Um, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful businesses. I mean, I'm thinking now of um, Grow Cycle. So Grow Cycle are in Totnes and Devon. And Eric and the team have created these extraordinary mushroom growing kits. They're, they're running courses on how you can grow mushrooms. Obviously, it's a, a wonderful protein. Um, it could replace meat in a really big way. So that business grow cycle from this kind of tiny workshop in Devon is actually creating something that's a really future-proof and dynamic business. Um, then we've got the be beautiful walking jackets by McNair in Huddersfield. Again, uh, a superb factory that's employing local people. They're using Yorkshire wool. Um, you know, is their strap line made proper in Yorkshire? And they really are. It's, it's the real thing. Um, I mean, I could go on forever, honestly, Joe. Absolutely. I know you have furniture uh, makers. Yes, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have got some, you know, wonderful brands. And certainly anybody listening, I recommend to obviously to go on the site because there's a, it's a fantastic directory of the talent across the UK. And to know that there's a sustainable ethos behind that um, gives the consumer, I'm sure, uh, you know, excellent conviction to want to, to, to buy from um, these makers. So what, what sort of plans do you have for the future to support the makers that you have on your directory? Well, we're in a funny future. I really believe that. I mean, COP26 is happening now. Obviously, the very kind of ethos of, of the core ethos is sustainability for Blue Patch. And um, I have spent a lot of last year really looking at carbon calculators and uh, all these accreditation schemes about carbon. And I have kind of done a deep dive into what this really means for um, an SME, a small and medium sized business. And you can't get away from the fact that you've got to cut, calculate your scopes, your science based targets. Scopes are different emission levels, one, two, and three. So we have uh, got a fantastic members called called Green Element, who are environmental consultants, and their calculator compare your footprint is the one that we're going to be using with their support um, in the new year. And we're gonna be running groups for members to get everyone to understand and get their actual scopes audited. So it's not greenwash, these are actual figures that will deliver them impact reports. And come next year, we will have impact report links on the Blue Patch microsites. So anyone going to the site will be able to go straight in and look at the actual impact, both social and environmental of that business. So we're doing, we have a members hub. So when members join us, they get access to the members hub, a members only newsletter, and all these workshops um, and support groups will be going out to members through the members only newsletter. Um, I think as time has gone on, I've realized I really want to bring the group tighter together, all the members, because there is so much to learn. And we know that we can support that learning for free really easily. Um, so that, that's really what we're gearing up to do from January, 2022. We've also realized that lots of, of small businesses are time poor. So we've brought in two social media experts and trainers and we're going to start the, the Blue Patch Social Brackets Media Club. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it starts this month. Um, and we're just going to kind of take back social media. We're going to create conversations that are around topics that are really important for everybody. So we're going to almost do a kind of reverse hack on social media. Instead of running us, we're going to run it and we're going to really start talking to each other. Um, so that's the other thing we're going to do. And then um, sort of embargoed, but lots of work with museums coming up, which we're, we're kind of signing off at the moment. So those are superb projects, but um, unfortunately I can't really share them at the moment. All, uh, all sounds really excellent for the future. So um, what would you say um, in terms of, you're one of the first to bring together, it seems, uh, as an organisation, uh, sustainable businesses way back before it became on trend. Um, so how do you see things changing now in the future? Because you've been on this journey for some time. 
Um, so where do you see this going? And, 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 and linked with that, obviously, that's consumer demand. And as you mentioned, the social media, how we connect and um, articulate in many ways what um, these makers are doing. Uh, yeah, I just wondered how you see that for the future. Yes. Um, I Well, interestingly, because we've just launched the Positive Shopping magazine and we're distributing it now. Um, this is a little A5 catalogue. Here you are. <laughs> Here. Great. Uh, 32 pages um, showing members. There you are, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> and it also tells the story of Blue Patch. So it's really talking about our national campaign. So when we talk about the future of sustainability and how the consumers are going to respond to it, what we're doing through the Power of Positive Shopping campaign is really creating a kind of pinch effect for the customer. And we're saying, look, these are incredible local businesses. You sustain the local economy, but you also are contributing to sustainability. Now, because all our members are working with sustainability, they're on different, in different parts of the journey, no one's gonna be perfect. It's a work in progress. The whole Blue Patch model is designed to support community-owned renewable energy. So under the umbrella of our positive shopping campaign, consumers know that they're supporting businesses that are independent and, and fantastic, but they also know that they're supporting this kind of bigger picture organisation. And we're contributing 100% of our surplus, that's not 1%, 100% into community-owned renewable energy. So if you like, the bigger Blue Patch grows, the bigger our contribution to community energy and the faster we can help mitigate climate change. So in a sense, Blue Patch is a bit like the, the very first seed of something like the National Trust. You know, We're launching this massive network to simply give 100% of everything back to support communities and the green economy. So that is an emergent story for Blue Patch as we push this campaign outward. Um, for the consumer, I've been talking to people in the street mm -hmm. a lot, talking to them about these, the businesses and the catalogue, and they are all saying, what a fantastic idea. We are looking for things that are you know, made by real people and have sustainability at their core. So it is definitely something that's in the zeitgeist with the consumer, for sure, for sure. But the quality has got to be there and the delivery has to be seamless, really. Absolutely. It's, it's great to hear that um, conversations are happening with the consumer because that's the bit that's missing is how we connect with consumers and feed that um, the, the information about how products are made, um, where they're made, who's making them, all of those elements. Um, you know, how else do you communicate that um, through, through the, the events maybe that you've done in the past? For example, I know obviously things have changed uh, with COVID and the impact there. Um, how best do you think that is to communicate it to the consumer? Uh, absolutely through talking. <laughs> Again, it goes back to that old fashioned thing. It's called the conversation and you can't beat it. So um, we did a, a, a shop at the Whitworth in Manchester, the beautiful National Textile Archive. And we had 50 of our brands there. And I spent a few days up there talking to customers. And again, you know, the narratives that we were exchanging with consumers, they were absolutely blown away. And someone came in that shop and said, I just feel completely different now I have visited this shop. And the same when we did a pop-up in Shoreditch, people coming in and saying, I feel completely different about life. It's like we give this burst of, of joy to people because they're suddenly seeing something that's not about cutting corners and, you know, cutting out profit it, and it's not extractive, it's generous. It's generous in its spirit. And the consumers are really into that. Absolutely. And actually, interestingly on that, um, price is obviously often an issue for some consumers when you say this is a UK made product, it's been handmade, etc. I just wondered, how, did you have any conversations around price, actually? Does that, how that impacts? Price is, yes, it's different. My goodness, yes, people are definitely having to pay more. 
But one of the conversations I would have about that is, look, the people are being paid in essentially what's a first world economy. Yes. You know, the cost of living is high here. And then pointing out that we pay tax. And uh, very often people aren't connecting, you know, the fact that we pay tax with actually the fact that we live in, you know, um, a very sort of caring democracy that we've got the NHS, that we've got schools and all the rest of it. So there's just making those connections for people and having conversations around where does money go in the economy? So the whole economic model becomes more viable once, once they understand that. And yeah. that the money stays in the economy. I mean, you've got the multiplier effect. So if you sell something that's made here and you, uh, you buy something here, it's gonna be 10 times the value of something that you've bought through Amazon that's been made on a warehouse in a warehouse ship en route. So instead of losing money out of the economy by investing here in a really beautiful product, not only do you get quality that's probably five times better, but you're also enriching the local economy and you're, you know, you enable the whole thing to sustain. So you, you benefit twice. Yeah, and certainly where we are based up on the Highlands and Islands in Murray, we have more remote locations and we want to keep as many talented people living on those islands in those rural locations and sharing their craft as well. So it, it's really important that um, people appreciate that in, in the, the value of the product being made. And obviously having videos of the product being um, the, the time scale or the hands-on technique that all must help too in, in terms of communicating that to um, consumers who maybe haven't thought about that in the past. Yes this is def definitely a, a big element of our museum work you know which will unfold in 2022 is that we're going to be um, doing more Instagram reels so our, our new Instagram trainer uh, will be supporting reels with members and those will be available for people visiting the museum so be able to kind of you know wave your mobile phone at, a, at um, one of your duvets and then then learn about the guard hair and and all you're doing to be a circular product and, and where they're made so for the consumer the, the journey comes alive suddenly it's no longer just an object it's an object with a whole provenance and a story and a location. And that's one of the things about the Blue Patch directory. It's got location search. And we're now looking at creating landing pages for Wales, for Scotland, for Ireland, so that we can really kind of celebrate regional specialisms as well. And I think that will be, you know, there's lots of potential to do that, to really bring the, the islands to life. Excellent. I mean, that, that sounds music to our ears, obviously, because um, certainly Expo North is, an organization that um, supports creative industries and we have a lot of makers in this region um, many who've been working on on their practice for many years and um, producing fantastic products and obviously without the the tourist flow that have have been here over the the last year and a half that's impacted a lot on on those makers and it's important that they you know are able to tell their story still but in a in a new way through digital means I think so, yeah. And the storytelling is really critical. So we've we've been doing the Blue Patch Sustainable Business Awards for uh, six years now. And next year, I'm going to change the whole emphasis of the awards into um, projects that people have done, because the quality of our businesses is so extraordinarily high. You cannot compete a business against a business, but you can look at the stories of projects they've done. I mean, again, I can't talk about that at the moment because we're just about to, on Thursday, um, announce the shortlist for this year. But um, some of the unique achievements that members are doing that really contributes to their own culture are really staggering, really staggering. And those stories are the things we want to publish in the next Positive Shopping Catalogue and to showcase in museums. So what we're doing is we're tying businesses into the cultural roots but also into the future, into circularity, sustainability, and everything that's gonna happen, have to happen in the next 10 years.
Excellent. Oh, well, it's really exciting to hear um, about what you're doing with Blue Patch. I think it's a, an amazing organisation and the support that you offer the members. And certainly, you know, looking forward to um, seeing what the future plans are. So just for anyone watching, um, the website is bluepatch.org. Is that is that correct, Jane? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> .org. Um, and yes, so certainly recommend people to have a, a look on to, um, to see see what you're doing so thank you very much for your time today i really appreciate thank it thank you joe thank bye bye, you. bye. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, it would be great for if you could start and tell us about fox water sure so i'm the founder of fox water we're a manufacturer and designer of water filtration products based here in glasgow Great. And tell us, where did the idea for Fox Water come from and, and what, what does it actually do exactly? So back in 2016, uh, I was using what was then our competitor's product. And so I had a bit of a, an acid reflux problem and I never wanted to like medicate for it. And I was doing a bit of research online. I found that alkaline water actually had some benefits to like neutralizing stomach acid and stuff. And so I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll try that before any kind of medication. And it really worked for me. Um, and at the time I was using the product and, you know, I, I used to just drink tap water. Um, when I bought this water filter, I thought like, this is a bit of a game changer for me. And I knew that potentially I could make something better. I'd really like to be in that market. And at the time I had a previous business that was in the water industry, but nowhere near um, e-commerce. It wasn't manufacturing, it was a service side. And it kind of, um, it got me really interested. So I did a bit of research. I found that it was a bit difficult to get um, replacement filters. And to be honest, I thought the product could be a bit better, even though the water tasted nice and it, it was doing well for me. Like I thought I could maybe make a bit of an impact here. And so we started to sell our version one product uh, at the time, which was very similar to what our competitors was. Now that was the easy entrance to the market. We didn't have a huge amount of money to spend on designing and developing a product at that time. I think I started the business for like 7,000 pounds you know how expensive it is to manufacture something here. So we had to get our foot uh, in the market somehow. A couple of years later, we, we had developed what would be our innovative product, um, which has become a bit of a game changer for us. And so basically all of our competitors' products are water filter jugs. So you fill it up with filtered water, it goes through the filtration cartridge and then clean, tasty water comes out the back. Now, all of our competitors' product had this thing. So we always had that. Our mission is always about single-use plastic reduction. We felt a bit hypocritical with the version one product because we had this disposable cartridge that you had to throw away every 30 days, the same as all of our competitors. And we really wanted to design that out. Um, so with the reinvent the wheelie, but how do we like allow customers to put the water, new water filtration granules in? Those are the only things that expire. So we did some numbers on it. We realized that 100 million of these water filter cartridges were going to landfill every single year. So we knew we had to change that. So we designed a reusable and refillable cartridge, which is in the V2 now. So any customer who's using a Fox product has zero plastic waste and their carbon footprint through their water filtration needs are around 75% lower than the competing brands. That's fantastic. That is amazing because, you know, I'm sure you, you know, you'll know the numbers many, many people, particularly living in urban areas, will have water filtering systems in their house because the, just the nature of the water coming through the taps can, can vary, uh, you know, across the country too. So um, to be able to reduce the plastic uh, within it, uh, we all know the different competitive brands, I'm sure, that offer that um, is, is just brilliant. So what, other, what, are, what are the key elements then about what you're offering that make it sustainable? So the main thing is the refillable cartridge, the fact that people don't have to throw out any plastic. Um, as I say, if 100 million are going to landfill every single year and they don't degrade for three or 400 years, think about the compounding effect of like what's sitting in landfill and will be sitting in landfill for, for uh, generations. So that's the main one. And then the CO2 reduction is a combination of one, you're not injection molding a plastic cartridge every 30 days for every customer you have, like our competitors. Um, to the, the refill packs that you get. So when it's time to, to buy a new refill pack, you need to you know put new filtration granules in your filter. What you need to do is you buy a refill pack that lasts you three months and it will fit through your letterbox. 
So normally these caches are quite bulky, they would never go through your letterbox. But our refill packs are in sachets because you're simply pouring them into your, your uh, filter that lasts you for two, three, four years, whatever the, the lifespan of the product is. So that's another saving. There's no uh, missed deliveries, which is a big CO2 emitter in the supply chain. The fact that if you're not home or you're at work, like the, the delivery driver has to come back two or three times. So we built all of that in and, and together it's around a 75% reduction in CO2, uh, which comes from the plastic reduction, which is really the main thing for me. And um, in terms of manufacturing the product, uh, where is it made? So the products, I'm sitting in Glasgow right now. Everything's made within a 30 mile radius. Now, so that's injection molded, there's glass involved, the packaging, the assembly, and then everything else, our head office is here. And so there is a caveat there, like there is a couple of raw materials that we can't get in Scotland. Um, one of the main ingredients in our filter packs is uh, coconut shell carbon. So like activated carbon derived from coconut shells. And I don't know if you noticed, but we're not really growing many coconuts in Scotland. Yeah. So, so we need to import that. But like generally, everything that gets put into the product, minus a couple of raw materials, is done within 30 miles of Glasgow. That's incredible that you've been able to manufacture in such a short distance from where you're based. What were the challenges in that? Uh, because I'm sure that wasn't straightforward. The biggest challenge at the start was really just cost, like being able to buy the injection mold tooling to make the product, to make the plastic parts of the product. Now, like that was, I think that cost is, you know, just shy of £100,000 all in. And well, it took us a long time to build that amount of capital to, to be able to do that. We did a pre-launch campaign as well to let people buy the product ahead of uh, launch, which really helped us bulk up that um, that tooling budget as well. So that was really the most difficult thing. Finding suppliers was difficult as well. When you're such a small company, people don't really take you seriously. So we were lucky that eventually we found a partner on the engineering side that, that you know, um, believed in us um, and it's paid off for both of us so that was pretty difficult and um, right now packaging is becoming an issue not particularly because it's in Scotland it's just a, a an issue in Europe really with lead times but generally see when you get the supply chain set up it's a breath of fresh air because it, well if you're comparing it to maybe manufacturing in China it really is a breath of fresh air when you get it set up when you've got over that capital expenditure Excellent. And what sort of support have you received in the development of the product through to the business at this stage? I'm sure there's a range, but just a sort of overview of that would be great. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot. Like, I think I got pretty good at um, winning grants and winning competitions, and, and I kind of had to. Like, we didn't really have a choice. So we've never raised capital. We, we've never sold shares in the business. Um, we've never raised investment. The traditional route, we've only ever really received grant funding. So with the support from Unlocking Ambition, um, which was tremendous, which got us onto the uh, account managed side of Scottish Enterprise, of which we did support before, but like, it just became another level of support. We get innovation uh, funded through Scottish Enterprise, which was all because we were on the Unlocking Ambition programme. We've won three Scottish Edge Awards, which has also been game changing for us. Um, and Glasgow City Council has helped us with like premises and staffing. And to be honest, like I cannot speak highly enough of the support system in Scotland generally. And don't get me wrong, like we had to get very good at understanding how to find these opportunities and then how to make sure that like we told these people that we existed and, and told them our story. And and eventually when it got to that stage, like the, the, the support came. But um we wouldn't be where we are without the support, absolutely. That's excellent. It's great. And, and also, you know, you're selling a lot. We know that um, it, it's a successful business. The, the, the model that you've developed and is working. You're, you're exporting. You've, you're in John Lewis now, aren't you? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So where, would you like to tell us where else you're selling or, or how, how, you, how you're selling your products? Yeah, so I'll break it down in terms of... Um, sales volume so like the vast majority of our sales i would say uh 70 65 to 70 percent of our sales on a monthly basis are through a website so that's direct to consumer we control the whole experience for the customer and i think that's really important because 
it's going to drive repeat purchase and it's going to build um it's going to build a really good relationship between you and the customer which then drives the word of mouth sales um, the second part is probably then Amazon, and um, and so we uh, we're not best of friends with Amazon, but it's almost like a necessary evil because of how many customers are there. They have accounts, they get next day delivery. It's so convenient for people. It's almost like shooting ourselves in the foot not to be there. So we're on Amazon. That's probably the second most uh, popular in terms of. So I think in terms of numbers, we're probably talking 65, 70 percent through a website. Then you're talking maybe 20 percent through Amazon and the other 10 percent is retail um, and so our first retailer was Selfridges so we started to sell, sell through Selfridges it was a really big name brand but they don't have as many uh, sites or locations as John Lewis so John Lewis is a bit, a bit higher volume for us it's relatively early in the relationship and we're starting to see like much bigger purchase orders being made before Christmas and um, so that that took maybe a few months to build but generally they all complement each other well sometimes People see us on the internet and then they see us in John Lewis and they buy it, um, or it could be the other way around. So generally, the John Lewis and Selfridges relationships have been really good validation points for us online if we're trying to convert someone online and they can't be bothered going out to John Lewis. Like they might think, well, it must be a good product if it's sold there. So on, on the e-commerce piece, it's been a good validation uh, point for us to be in those stores. That's excellent. And what sort of advice would you give to anyone who's watching who may have an idea like you have um, before they set off on that journey? What sort of advice would you give them? I would say if you've got an idea and you haven't started it yet, like definitely continue to develop it. Like if it excites you and it genuinely excites you, I remember like when I started this company, it's all I could think about. And I was running my previous business. Like I couldn't wait to like find a way to get out of my previous business and into the next one. Like if that is how you feel about it. Like you need to be seriously all in on it. And I don't mean like leave your job the next day. I, I think you should really de-risk it. So if you have an idea and you don't know if it's a guaranteed success or you don't believe it's a guaranteed success, it's hard to know that at the start. Continue to build out your research. Try and have a very low risk way of finding if you have a market there and um, make sure you've got a solid usp like is there a big difference between your idea your potential product and the people you're going to be selling against like why are you going to have an advantage over them because you probably will need it don't get me wrong there's plenty of me too products that are the same as anything else that can make a success but sometimes it's not the most um, exciting businesses to be part of so like try and build that out try and keep your job keep a steady income, don't make massive risks. And um, it, it can really put too much pressure on the business. And if you need to take money out early, it can sometimes drown the business because the business is going to need probably all of the money it generates in the first two or three years. So just try and, try and build that into the equation. But apart from that, like, like try it, like try it out. You probably regret it if you do not try something. If it's a good idea, get as many mentors around you as you can. Get as many people using some sort of prototype of the product as you can and go for it. Excellent. Well, certainly um, you've done a great job with Fox Water and look forward to the future to see what uh, what's next with um, development. Is there a V3 on the way or are you? Are there, you is. there is. <laughs> There's a V3 prototype about 10 yards away from me right at this point in time. Um, we're probably going to launch V3, what are we, early November, probably like late, probably April probably April time, definitely by summer V3 will be on the market. Um, it's a pretty cool product, but actually in the next month, we've got another product launching. I can't tell you what it's called because telling you what it's called, we we'll give it away. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a secret because it's a, it's a direct shot at one of our competitors. So I'm excited about this product. Um, it's a bit of a different uh, line for us to take. It's, it's a water filtration product, but it's a, it's a it's going to get us access to customers who we may otherwise not have had access to. So quite excited about it. Excellent. Oh, sounds great. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Izzy, delighted to have you on Zoom today. It's great to catch up again and hear about all the exciting things that you're doing with your business and with plans for COP26 as well. So to begin with, I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us about Wing Grow Foods. Uh, thank you, Joanne. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, 
so about me, um, Green Grow Foods is one of the uh, startups or spin out that Aurora Sustainability has created uh, as a way to demonstrate the circular economy. Aurora Sustainability Group is the overarching uh, uh, group where uh, uh, Green Grow Foods sits. Green Grow Foods is an endeavor to use uh, wasted resources um, present in the local area, uh, especially agri-waste, um, to grow uh, mushrooms. Uh, for uh, By agri-waste, I mean uh, um, spent brewery grains or uh, coffee waste, uh, or even, uh, you know, hemp from the stocks, um, you know, the hemp stocks, whatever is uh, left from the industry or sawdust that, that contains uh, lignin. Lignin is a compound that mushrooms are after. So they grow very well on that. So we started this endeavor a few years ago in the 2016, I think, or probably 15, and we were already doing it because uh, we were taking two workshops in which we were talking about sustainability to corporates and uh, public uh, agencies. Um, we were talking about uh, circular economy, and nobody understood it. So Ian had a quirky idea, my business partner Ian, had a quirky idea to grow mushrooms on coffee waste. And he was taking this little bag of, you know, of mushrooms uh, everywhere we were going and people were getting it. They were getting that wasted resources in reality are fuel for, you know, whichever, um, ways we find to ups, uh, upgrade it instead of discarding it in the landfill. And this project was probably, I would say dormant for um, a couple of years until uh, uh, the Scottish Edge came along. So we uh, won the Scottish Edge uh, pitching for uh, creating several outputs from mushrooms. Uh, uh, one was biomaterials. We are still working with the Glasgow School of Art on that. Uh, and the biomaterials development, actually, it is another wasted material from mushroom growing. So it goes to do something like insulation or uh, design panels. Um, but uh, the main uh, uh, output that we had uh, thanks to the Scottish Edge was to create a food line. Uh, food has been a passion of mine since probably I was 30 when I understood that food waste was a big uh, problem, but also the capacity to utilize food at the full potential for our body uh, and for our health. So when I was 30, I had a cancer. And uh, because my family has a farm in Italy, I started to grow my own food, uh, which before was grown by the farmers. You know, uh, I didn't uh, have a real touch with it, even though I studied uh, agriculture. And we had a lot of courses and we had a lot of, you know, practice. But for me, personally, I never did it. And it changed everything. So once I started to, uh, develop some food products with the mushrooms, uh, we were very successful. Uh, we had um, a lot of response from the public, but also from the scientific community. Uh, the Raut Institute in Aberdeen gave us um, a five stars review, practically saying, well, you created functional food. I didn't even know what it was, functional food. And um, so we created mushroom, uh, a mushroom fiber based protein, uh, which is available in every of our meals. Our meals are a series of meals uh, uh, that are very quick to cook, but very high standards ingredients, like, you know, uh, organic uh, arborio risotto with mushrooms and with all the flavoring, every, all the seasoning, every ingredient is already provided. So people just have to add water and cook it. Um, or even the vegan agis, we have that as well. 
So this is mainly the story. There is more because last year I developed uh, other products, uh, which are functional food supplements, superfoods. So essentially, again, uh, an assembly, a, a mix of uh, ingredients that they are working well together. And eventually I even did a, a nutrition degree, a vegan nutrition degree last year over the pandemic. So it's interesting, the journey of food. That's fantastic. That's green grow food. Um, I, I've got to say the um, mushroom risotto and mushroom soup are my favourites of the two that I've had from you. They're absolutely delicious and can recommend them. So obviously the, you know, the core of what you have done here is about using um, by, you know, waste, you know, bringing together, uh, creating a great product from um, growing from waste products. Can you talk about the sustainable elements of that and and how that all, all works. The sustainable element is uh, essentially uh, diverging uh, food waste from landfill is a no-brainer. Um, so when uh, we discard our food, more than any other uh, um, litter, actually food breathes, you know, because it's organic and it produces even more carbon emissions. So, um, in theory, uh, the least that we should do is discard food. We should utilize food to produce energy. Uh, we should utilize food to produce new soil, uh, but we should never uh, send it to landfill. You know, uh, compost is the easiest uh, way to use uh, um, food waste, and this is what we did in creating um, the the mycelium-based uh, 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 soil amendment. You know, uh, essentially the, the process is this. We gather the agri-waste and then we inoculate the agri-waste with the mushroom spores. So the agri-waste uh, will go to landfill, we recover it, we inoculate it, and then we create a space where mushrooms could thrive also from recovering wasted resources of uh, heat. So whenever there is heat available that is in abundance, uh, like your laundry, uh, the, that heat can be uh, channeled through greenhouses or through, in our case, uh, um, the shipping containers in which the heat will essentially recreate autumn for the mushrooms and autumn is where they thrive as you know, many of us going through the woods these days, we find lots of mushrooms uh, over autumn because it's what I like. They like to have the warmth of the summer underneath the, the soil. As soon the temperature shocks, the mushrooms could feel, okay, this is a time in which I won't dry out if I go out so they will emit the fruiting body and the fruiting body will release the spores everywhere. We are totally surrounded by mushroom spores at all time. And, you know, the element of mushrooms actually is a sustainability, um, probably prime uh, element because mushrooms are digesters. So in nature, they uh, digest everything in order to make those nutrients available for other uh, organisms. So uh, to give you an example, when you find a rotten wood in the forest, there will be always mushrooms there, but not just. Also, we make bread out of mushrooms or uh, uh, beer out of mushrooms because it's a process of fermentation. But then when this uh, uh, bread and beer is discarded, they produce all the mushrooms. So it is a cycle that goes on and on in order to make all the nutrients always available to other organisms. And this is probably this, the best sustainability aspect that I can tell about the mushrooms. But also it has to do with our guts, because in our guts, uh, Mushroom, there are mushrooms constantly living there. 
So as we feed them well with proper food and uh, um, capacity to maintain our biodome, which is what is called uh, either in soil and in our belly. Um, that is another element of sustainability because we must not forget sustainability is also about people. We provoke the unsustainable angle and we are the ones who are receiving actually the you know bad bargain of unsustainability. So we the social aspect of sustainability probably is the most important aspect. Absolutely. And in terms of working with people on this and launching the product and also sourcing the ingredients, um, the, the spent, the, the food waste, how, how did you go about that? How did you approach companies and how willing were they to, to work with you on this? We approached uh, a few companies around in this area. We wanted to maintain the supply chain as local as possible. And uh, so here uh, nearby, there is a, a sawmill, Loggy sawmill, and they were uh, um, absolutely delighted to support us with uh, providing uh, sawdust in order to uh, grow the mushrooms. Um, there is a brewery nearby in Lossy Mouth um where uh, the windswept uh, brewery and uh, we uh, got the brewery grains the spent grains uh, uh, which are full of nutrients and uh, proteins uh, and uh, we recover those um so whenever they were doing making beers a couple of days a week uh, we were going and collecting it um wells we have been uh, uh, working also with uh, uh, bakeries, uh, two bakeries in this area in Inverness and uh, in Nairn. Both of them um, asked us to experiment with the mushrooms and we did, and it was very successful. But the problem with bread is that there is a, a risk of contamination. So unless you are really nearby there, you are competing with all the mushrooms in the in the waste, but if we were totally sitting next to their facilities, or they, if they had a mushroom facility next to them, that would have been a very good viable uh, supply chain. Very good. And and in terms of how you're selling it, where 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 do we see Green Grow Foods? So uh, Green Grow Foods uh, is selling only online. We are selling through our uh, uh, shop and also through Amazon. Amazon has been uh, really important for us over the pandemic. Mm. At the beginning, we were uh, not happy about Amazon because Amazon has a lot of, you know, unsustainable angles. But actually, we realized that for a small business where uh, you are shipping yourself, uh, Amazon is only a, a, a showroom. You know, we are not giving our products to Amazon to be fulfilled by people who are, you know, working very little hours and and uh, in very poor uh, environments or salaries. Um, but of course, it is still supporting uh, a giant that we would like to get away from, and actually we are working on it. But we are still having the best sellers on Amazon because it's where the numbers are. Um, and this is probably the main problem of sustainability. Uh, but having the pro products on Amazon also helps um, the outreach for whoever wants to find uh, uh, vegan and uh, um, plastic free products, because our packaging is also plastic free. Um, where uh, they wouldn't even look for us uh, over the, the web, but they wouldn't find us. So it is also important, I think, to be present where there is the mass consumerism, because it's the way we can influence them. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think that's an interesting take for businesses based here in the Highlands and Islands, is, is how do you reach the customer who's potentially looking for that product that you're selling but doesn't know you exist. It's a very crowded space. Uh, the big guys tend to dominate 
And as you say, you, you often have to go where um, the customer, well, you have to go where the customer is. And Amazon certainly at this point is a route to that. Um, but there are lots of other options starting to happen. There's smaller marketplaces we can see happening too now. So um, we'll see how that future evolves. So in terms of, you know, you have a background of experimentation, of innovation, of driving change. And I know both you and Ian are absolutely passionate about this and have been for many, many years. Um, what advice would you give to someone who maybe has an innovative idea and they want to, to take that through to, to the next stage? What, what advice would you give? My suggestion would be to um, give it a try because uh, with a small investment, probably less than 5,000 pounds, you can start. And in starting up, especially in UK and in Europe, you have a lot of support from other uh, public agencies, from uh, the business ecosystem. So there is a lot of support available out there. Um, I wouldn't say the same for the other uh, areas of the planet, but I know uh, when you have an idea that is actually ahead of the curve, if you are re uh, reaching out for people who have been in your place before and ask for introductions, actually it happens even uh, where uh, the support from the public spaces is not available. Like uh, I think at the United States or India, uh, where uh, ways of introduction are opening the doors for big investment. So there is always a way. And uh, I think uh, innovation is so important. And uh, giving up to a creative idea uh, in order to, um, you know, uh, just go for a job that is, uh, you know, nine to four and then you are home actually it won't fulfill uh, your uh, soul. And this is really important. And having uh, your own business uh, that is fueled by your ideas, by your energy, sometimes is draining, but most of the time is so rewarding. Yes, I think I can vouch for that. It is 24 seven as well, because when it's your own business, you can't get away from it. Uh, but uh, you have the highs and the lows. And uh, I think you do need to be a certain type of character to be able to, to take that on. Anyway, Izzy, thank you so much. Um, delighted to have this time with you this morning. And uh, we wish you all the best with Green Go Foods. Thank you. Thank you to Scott, Izzy and Jean for sharing your stories with us today. For those living in the Highland and Island and Murray region, if you're looking for support with your creative business, do get in touch with us at exponorth.co.uk. Thank you.